Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our VIAM training, uh, well, to our virtual training. Um, we're really glad that everyone could uh, be a part of this, and a thank you to uh, Stephen and Rob, who are dialing in from the US in order to be able to do the training for you all. Um, just to give you a bit of an introduction, uh, Rob uh, is the um, account manager for us uh, based in, in the US, and Stephen is the vice president of Viom, and they will be providing the training for this evening. So we're really glad that, that they have joined us. Um, and just in terms of what we're going to go through, um, we got some great questions from, from all of you in terms of what you wanted um, to understand a bit more about Viom. So we'll go through how to implement Viom and interpret results with your patients, uh, gain a better understanding of the science behind the test, and understand how this may change the nutrition recommendations that you make. So I hope that uh, you find this training very valuable. Um, if you've got any questions, you can pop them onto um, to, to us and we will address all the questions at the end of the session. So thank you everyone and over to Rob and Stephen. Thanks Shelley, uh, this is Stephen Barry. Rob and I will tag team um, this uh, little class. Um, I will start off with a little bit more about Viome, what we do, who we are, uh, the science behind it, um, and then Rob will talk more uh, about how you actually can use um, the results in your practices with your patients. Um, while I love the fact that we can be doing this digitally um, in our virtual world, I have to admit I'd much would prefer to be there in South Africa with all of you, uh, and specifically to be in Cape Town at my most favorite coffee shop in the world, uh, Truth Cafe. So I would I would love to be broadcasting from, from Truth Cafe right now, instead of Seattle, Washington. So let me tell you a bit more about Viome. Um, basically, the, the philosophy, the vision of Viome in the beginning, going back now three years ago, was we'd love to imagine a world where illness is optional. And, and by that, we'd love to be able to provide tools and information to, to people so they can make choices about their health and those choices would then lead them to have illness only being an option if they choose to follow the advice of, of you, the practitioners, and the information that we, that we provide. So who are we? So in a nutshell, we have tools that digitize the human body. And we do that so we can, we can understand the root causes of chronic diseases based on a functional analysis of the microbiome, the mitochondrial function, and human gene expressions. Today, we'll be talking mostly about the microbiome because that's what's uh, available in South Africa at the moment. But we look at all of this in terms of painting a full picture of what's happening inside the body. And we've, we've basically created an artificial intelligence driven personalized therapeutics platform, okay? That has applications to help people prevent lower risk and reverse chronic disease. And there's my arrow down there. Okay, so the main thing that we'll talk about, which is what which we've been known for over the past couple of years, is our gut intelligence uh, test. We now have done over 125,000 people uh, around the world. It's only the most comprehensive gut microbiome test, and in a minute I'll talk to you about why it's very different than other microbiome uh, tests. And we basically have the world's largest database of metatrans metatranscriptomic data um, in the world. So. As you probably know a little bit about it, if you've already been exposed to Biome, um, uh, custom orders a kit uh, fulfilled uh, through um, our partner and distributor in South Africa. They answer a questionnaire, and then they send the stool sample back, back to us. We do an analysis using a proprietary RNA sequencing. I'll talk more about that. And then uh, you and the patient get results personalized about foods and supplement recommendations. And that's what Rob will spend a lot of time talking about. How do you how do you use those in the practice? So the therapeutics platform is the metatranscriptomic technology, the sequencing that we do. Again, we're the only commercially licensed laboratory in the world allowed to do this. We use translational science and we use artificial intelligence. Those three things allow us to come up with our, 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 our clinical recommendations. So we'll talk more about the RNA sequencing, but basically we take a look at the gene expression of the microbiome. So as you may recall, DNA doesn't, it's not active, doesn't do anything. It's the expression of the DNA through RNA 
that then feeds the body in terms of what it should be doing, what it shouldn't be doing, and what interferes, do doesn't interfere with what's happening inside the body. We take the sequencing information, the RNA sequencing information, the gene expression information, and we use translational science to see what the patterns in these pathways are, to see the differences um, uh, in the gene expressions of an individual. And everybody's different. You could have similar uh, microbiome, but you could have very different pathways that are being turned on and turned off. And then because the amount of data that this, that this generates is about five gigabytes per, per individual, uh, no human being could analyze it in terms of coming up with the what we can do in terms of recommendations. We use some very sophisticated artificial intelligence to run through the databases, compare all the sequencing, and determine what are the best foods, what are the best supplements for someone to be to be taking. So a little bit more about, about RNA sequencing. And by the way, this was developed at the Los Alamos National Laboratories in the United States, which is a biodefense lab. It was originally developed for biodefense work to determine if something was introduced into the country, uh, an unknown kind of bacteria, for example, what was it actually doing? Not that it was there, but what was the genes inside the bacteria doing? And that's the expression of the RNA. So analyzing the RNA tells us exactly what's happening um, inside uh, the microbiome. It quantifies the composition and the functions. And that's the most important part. It's the function of the human genes that we want to understand because it's the functions that lead to disease or lead to health. And we can manipulate the functions. We can't change the DNA, but we can change what the DNA is, is doing. We can change the RNA, the expression of the DNA. So as I said, gene expression is just the beginning. It's the translational science that allows us to predict the biochemical activity and functions. So we can tell what molecules are being signaled, are being produced out of signaling, signaling molecules by the microbiome. We can tell the impact of food, drugs, and supplements on the microbiome and how that changes these pathways that are leading to either disease um, or, or leading to uh, lowering risk of disease. And this shows an example of an inflammatory activity. So obviously inflammation is a root cause of many, many diseases. So we look at the various gene pathways that are causing an increase in inflammation caused by the microbiome. And then we can use um, the TS and the AI to determine what foods might dampen that inflammatory activity, what supplements might dampen the inflammatory activity. And then artificial intelligence, again, because there's so much information, we need to have AI engines and all the algorithms to understand what that data is. And we use bioinformatics, machine learning, data science, and health informatics to build this database and to be able to predict uh, therapeutics, interventions, uh, we can predict disease. For example, um, uh, well, in the next slide, I'll talk about diseases that we can predict, but we also can predict the glycemic response to a food. So everybody's glycemic response to the same food is actually different and depends on the microbiome. And we can predict what an individual's response will be to a particular food based on their microbiome. And of course, that gets taken into account uh, in terms of the recommendations. We also can, we also do uh, a lot of things beyond just this um, uh, consumer testing through, through physicians with the microbiome. We can actually uh, diagnose uh, oral cancer from a salivary sample of microbiome. We can diagnose stage one, two, three, four, and actually even, even pre-stage one just by evaluating the, uh, the microbiome of the, uh, of the, of the saliva. Why are we talking about the microbiome in this, you know, uh, in general? It's because the microbiome and all of its activities are involved in most, if not all, the biological processes that constitute human health and disease. You know, this is a giant statement. It's not something that we, we that we're making up. Uh, the last 10 years of research has now shown this to be true, that virtually all diseases start with an imbalance of some kind in the microbiome. Therefore, an analysis, understanding the microbiome, and then understanding how you can manipulate the microbiome is a key to, to, to health and to treatment. Um, just a little bit more um, on the fact that these chronic diseases begin in the gut. 
and they're connected to inflammation, weight, energy, mental health, and more. Um, and so I said DNA is not the solution. It doesn't change with any environmental factors. DNA remains the same throughout your life, but your, the expression of the DNA changes with diet, with stress, with exercise, with diseases, with pathogens. And that's why, why we want to manipulate the RNA and change the expression uh, of the genes. And that's the whole purpose of the results and recommendations that, that you get that Rob will talk about. Another underlying principle in what we do is that there's no universal diet. Um, I think people kind of understand that there's probably uh, you know, uh, no universal diet, but there's no universal food for everybody, okay? Because one food which may be healthy to someone may be harmful to somebody else. You know, broccoli uh, is a food we all probably recommend to patients. It's a healthy food, has lots of great phytochemicals uh, in it, um, but it turns out that in the United States, probably 30% of people should not eat broccoli because their microbes are producing high sulfide levels, which the broccoli is feeding. So for them, until they rebalance the microbiome, broccoli is actually harmful. Same with spinach, same could be with, with, with salmon. Those are good foods nutritionally, but for various reasons, they may, they may not be appropriate for a particular person. In, in the case of spinach, if someone's microbes can't metabolize oxalate, then you're gonna have buildup of oxalate in the body and that might cause you know, kidney stones, et cetera. Same thing with supplements, okay? Specific supplements, they can't um, uh, process properly uh, because of the microbiome. So it's important to understand that we need to personalize the supplements for someone based on what's happening inside their, inside their gut. Uh, we've published a number of um, uh, pa uh, papers. Uh, well, this, this one is one that we published, but this is the, a kind of a, a foundation paper that personalized nutrition is the key to health. So this is in Nature, certainly one of the most prestigious uh, journals. Um, the diet, microbiome interactions, and personalized nutrition are the key. We talk about the microbiome actually being related to all these diseases, whether it's inflammatory, whether it's cancer, metabolic diseases, liver diseases, GI diseases, obviously, neurological diseases. It turns out that imbalances in the microbiome are, are one of the main uh, causes and increased risk factors for things like Alzheimer's disease or autism. Uh, also, we're using the microbiome to determine which drugs can be effective um, for treating diseases. And we also understand that the microbiome actually interferes with the effectiveness of drugs. The latest example, of course, is L-DOPA used in Parkinson's disease. It doesn't work in about 35, 40% of the people. It turns out those people have a microbiome which actually eats and deactivates the L-DOPA drug. So if there's a way to change the microbiome, then the L-DOPA might be effective in those, in those people. So a lot of amazing research happening. Uh, this is kind of just talking more about the, the activity. It's the activity that's important, not the, not the composition, not who's there, but who's there and what they're doing. We, we can actually uh, uh, diagnose uh, various this chronic diseases just based on um, the microbiome, obesity, diabetes, depression, IBS, oral cancer. We actually tell your age within six years based just on, on your microbiome. So uh, there's a lot of potential for the microbiome in terms of diagnostics, which we're now just getting into for actual dis diseases and conditions. Published a couple of articles about our technology. Um, those are available. If you want to read more about the metatranscriptomic technology, how it works, um, why it's effective, why, why the sample uh, is preserved for, uh, for transit back to us. And then also on the right side is the paper uh, that links the microbiome activity to the glycemic index. And I think you'll find that fascinating and I know Next Biosciences has those available uh, for you. Uh, that's just part of the paper. This talks a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence. So if you look at the sequence of things, we have a sample, we do the sequencing, it goes into our bioinformatics pipeline. We add the questionnaires. So this is the phenotypes, the metadata from the, uh, from the customer. It goes into results, recommendations. We learn from it so we can keep on improving the engine. And then we have on the right side, the results or recommendations and any insights that we learn from that. And it's, it's a process that goes around in a circle. So every patient, every you know, thousand patients, we learn more and that gets fed back into the, into the database 
that get that gets fed back fed back into what we're learning, and then the results keep on improving, improving over over time as we learn more. And now I'll let uh, Rob talk about the app. All right, thank you, and Stephen. Rob, Rob, you'll you'll let you'll you'll give me some sign about changing the slide. Yeah, yep. I will. I'll, I'll uh, have you, Johnny, on the spot with the slide deck here, because actually I, I noticed a slide you didn't talk a lot about, but I may have you go back to, which was the glycemic index study with the banana and the bread, because I think that's just sure. such a possible example. Yeah, let me know when you want me to go back. I will. Will do. Um, so just to, to tie a bow on Stephen's comments there, the microbiome, I think it goes without saying, is incredibly critical for immune function and, and all of these other systems within the body. And until you understand the function of that system, you cannot make really precise nutritional and supplement interventions. But when you do know the function, when you can make those interventions, you can see dramatic results. And, and actually, some of the things Stephen didn't touch on is what we've seen with, with customers in terms of their results. I mean, we had a woman who over, the, you know, she was close to 400 pounds, uh, scheduled for a gastric bypass, she legitimately was placed on an 800 calorie per day diet for two weeks to prove that her body could lose the weight before she went in to get this stomach staple surgery. And over those two weeks, not only did she fail to lose weight, she actually gained weight. Um, and so she didn't qualify for the surgery. She ultimately got connected with us, um, followed, did the biome test, followed the food recommendations for about three to six months. And at that uh, three month mark, she was down about 70 pounds. And at the six month mark, she was down just under 200. Um, and so that's how powerful this system is. If you understand how it's functioning and then you can implement the food and nutrition recommendations. So in terms of the app, uh, what Steven just went through is all of the science that goes into the scores. And actually, Steven, if you uh, go to the next slide, uh, it should show the two sets of information that we're basically able to to produce and you can toggle up. So basically we give you two sets of information. The first is on the far left hand side of the screen, um, or sorry, the, the middle and the right uh, portions of the screen. These are your gut scores. What did we see in your, in your microbiome sample? Uh, what was the activity? What kind of microbes were there? And then based on all of that, we assign a score to these. Um, so that's the science aspect of it but then what to do about it. That's where the food and supplement recommendations come in. Uh, if you look at the picture on the far left-hand side of the screen, you can see my foods to minimize, my foods to avoid, superfood supplements. This is the interventional tool. And I think according to one of the questions I got from Shelly, the question is, that how do you imp implement these things into your daily life? Um, and and you know, do you focus on specific scores? Do you pick certain foods? How does all of this start to work together? Um, I want to zoom out one last time and hammer one point home, which is all of this information, these 20 microbiome scores, all of the food recommendations are really doing two things. We're answering the two questions. Uh, what good things are your microbiome producing? What bad things are they producing? And then how is your gut, what is the general health of your gut lining and GI tract? And then based on that information, here are the foods that are going to help you produce more good things and less bad things. And by eating this way, this is going to decrease inflammation and improve the overall function of your microbiome. Um, so one of the questions, going back to, to Shelly's question, how do you interpret these results with patients? How do you begin to implement this stuff? Uh, the nice thing, because you guys are already so well-educated in nutrition and uh, and in the system to to some degree, a lot of the answers will already be in the app. So when you click on any of these scores, it'll explain what the score means and uh, direct you to foods that may improve or by avoiding a certain food may improve uh, that particular score. And then when you're looking at the foods, there are explanations around the superfoods and the avoid foods in terms of why those foods are there. Um, so in terms of then implementing those food recommendations, I think the simplest thing is to say, look, most people eat the same things every day. Uh, you know, not now necessarily because you're not at the office every day, but you know, if you are at the office, 
you may go and get a salad every day from lunch or, or three out of five days a week, you're going to go get a salad. Looking at the meals that you eat on a regular basis and figuring out what do you constantly eat and asking, are those food, where do those foods stack up within my food recommendations? Uh, you know, if I get a spinach salad every day, is spinach an enjoy food? Should I be enjoying it? Is it a superfood? Or maybe to Stephen's point from earlier, if I don't break down oxalates well, or if my microbiome right now is producing a lot of uric acid, which spinach can contribute to, spinach may be a minimized food. And so thinking, all right, if I eat a spinach salad every day, it's actually a minimized food. What can I swap in for that? And looking through the food recommendations and noticing arugula or kale may in fact be an enjoy food or a superfood for you. Making that switch is, is the first step into implementing these food recommendations and finding that it makes a difference. Um, there was another question in terms of uh, understanding the nutritional recommendations. All right, uh, sorry. Uh, possi the possibility that the changes dramatically change uh, what you may currently be doing with a client. Um, and I guess the answer to that is thinking about it in the exact same way in that, you know, if, if you're having somebody eat a handful of nuts as a snack to create satiation because of the fat profile that's in nuts, um, looking at their food recommendations and noticing, okay, almonds are a minimized food, meaning you shouldn't eat a ton of them, uh, likely because of the high phytic acid content in almonds relative to other nuts. So pointing to that and saying, all right, have a handful of nuts, but maybe avoid almonds and utilize cashews or pistachios or something else that's on your enjoy or your um, superfood list. And why that's so important, why these foods make a big difference, I think the glycemic index study is the easiest example of this. So Stephen, if you don't mind going back to that that page, because I think it's it's powerful um, in explaining how important the system is uh, for how we react to food. So what this is showing is a study that we did back in 2018. We took 550 participants. We had each of them wear a continuous glucose monitor for two weeks, which means we knew what their blood sugar was doing at any point in time over those two weeks. Uh, we then purchased 27,000 meals for those folks uh, from a uh, very reputable grocery store here in the States, Whole Foods. I don't know if you guys have that in South Africa, um, but basically had Viome employees grocery shopping for these folks so that we knew everybody was getting the same foods. And then we partnered with an organization that had the ability to take a photo of a plate of food and tell you what foods were there on that plate and what were the relative proportions, what were the serving sizes. So in essence, we knew what they were eating, when they were eating it, what were the proportions, and what their blood sugar was doing before and after all of these, all of these eating. And of course, we sequenced their microbiome. So we knew what their microbiome was doing as well, what that functionality looked like. And from all of that information, we were able to build a highly predictive model, which could forecast what someone's blood sugar response would be to a particular food based on their microbiome activity. And that's what this is denoting. denoting. And why that's important is, as Stephen pointed out uh, earlier, a person's blood sugar response to a particular food is completely unique to that individual based on their microbiome activity. So the example here is we gave, uh, it's two participants, so participant P3 and P4, both were given or eat, ate a banana. The one on the left had a massive blood sugar spike, which is the green line. The one on the right had almost no blood sugar response to the banana. Uh, then we obviously gave them both uh, sprouted grain bread, independent of this, and saw the exact opposite response in terms of their, mic their uh, blood sugar response. So the notion that something like the glycemic index as a construct exists as a uh, rule of thumb for how people's blood sugar will respond to a particular food is not necessarily as helpful as we believed it to be because again according to this it's so individualized so tying all that back to 
the scores and the food recommendations and how to implement these things. At the highest level, if you're trying to plan macronutrients for patients, whether it's carbs, proteins, fats, and you're looking for what to choose from, well, the Viome results are the cheat sheet for what to choose from. Meaning if you're looking for specific carbs, the Viome results will show you, okay, brown rice is an avoid food, sweet potato is a superfood, quinoa is a minimized food. These are all carbs, but they are better or worse for you depending on the individual. And once you know that, then you can start to plan diets more strategically. Um, I'm gonna, Stephen, have you scroll through until you see uh, some scores. Because the final step here is perfect. Uh, what does this actually do for customers when they eat this way? Um, so what we have here, uh, Shelly was kind enough to provide her scores, um, which she's done a couple of tests. What this is showing are a test that she did in September of 2018 and a test that she then did in September of 2019, almost exactly one year later. And as Shelly followed the food recommendations and implemented things in this fashion, what we saw is almost all of her scores improve, which is remarkable uh, to, to see it, but, but I am less and less shocked every time this happens because it, it does become uh, kind of like clockwork in some degree, where if you are now eating for your microbiome and you're decreasing inflammation and the system begins to course correct, uh, you can see it in the data. You can simply see it in how much uh, LPS are you producing, which is a highly inflammatory compound or, or molecule. Um, is your digestive efficiency improving, meaning the way that things move through the digestive tract? Um, and so this is, this is uh, in a way, kind of the final product if you can implement the food recommendations over a long period of time. And keep in mind, uh, so this particular example was over the course of a year. Uh, it, it does take about six to 12 weeks for the microbiome to adjust to a new diet. Um, and so um, I'll close, I guess, with these two points. One is recognizing that it's, a, it's not like taking a pill. It's a bit of a slow adjusting process. And then two is, as that microbiome shifts over time to this new diet and um, that activity begins to change, it is important to retest and to take a look at um, how the foods may change over time because this is not... It's not DNA, it's not stagnant, it is gene expression, and uh, it's um, affected by environmental factors, so it is important to constantly retest. Um, and just to give you guys, and this will be my last comment here, in terms of retesting, uh, we do say it's like going, you know, do the first test, wait, follow the food recommendations for three to four months, uh, do a retest, see what's changed, see how the food recommendations may have been tweaked based on your new gut activity, and then treat it like going to the dentist. So check in uh, once or twice a year uh, after that point. So I just uh, talked for a long time. I'm gonna pause there and uh, turn it back over to Shelly. Great, thank you so much, Rob. Um, so what we'll do now is um, open up for any questions that any of you may have. Um, I'll just uh, maybe give uh, two minutes for anyone to send any questions through. Um, and then Ali will be able to tell us what the questions are. And um, I think whoever it's most relevant for can, can answer the question. But yeah, we can open up the floor now to any questions that anyone may have. Um, yeah, please, please send them through. We did such a good job, they have no questions. I, th I think that may be the case, Stephen. <laughs> not <laughs> not quite, we've got one question. Um, can the Viom test detect the likes of um, colon cancer in the same way that other cancers can be detected? I'm not sure who's best to answer that. Stephen. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can. Um, uh, so to do that, we would, uh, to offer it to people, uh, we would have to have uh, in the United States FDA approval for a diagnostic device. Um, 
uh, so which we don't. Um, we can detect uh, uh, colon cancer through the microbiome, um, but it's not. We are not uh, in front of the FDA yet with that to make that into an official diagnostic uh, test. We are doing that for the oral cancer test. We've received um, breakthrough device um, approval by the FDA, which means the the time for our next clinical study, which will which will be about eight thousand people, um, a multi-center study across the United States, um, is shortened. Um, from a couple of years uh, down to a, probably maybe a year process. Uh, and then if all goes well with that study, um, uh, then, then the FDA would give us um, permission to uh, market the test as a diagnostic test for oral cancer. So someday we um, would do it uh, um, in terms of diagnosing colon cancer. But what you can learn right now, because you probably uh, know there are things like butyrate production that are involved in in risk of colon cancer. There there are things all in terms of all the fermentation of fibers and the other short chain fat acids and stuff. They're involved in one increasing someone's risk of of colon cancer. So certainly you can use the Viome results um, to minimize um, someone's risk of of colon cancer. Uh, of course, we don't talk about colon cancer in uh, in the results. Anything you want to add, Rob? To that? No, great, thank you. You nailed it. Awesome. Next question we have is: Are oh, the supplements? Okay. If, if I can, if I, if I could just add. So, so the the Viome products um, are right now wellness products. So we do not um, diagnose particular um, diseases. Right. That's not to say that that information isn't there in the microbiome. It certainly is, and as, as I mentioned to you, we can we can diagnose you know probably 15 diseases, um, but for that for to do that in the United States, we have to ha we have to have FDA approval, which is a uh, you know several year process, and we're picking which ones we're going after uh, first for that kind of uh, diagnostic test. Sorry to interrupt. No, great. Thank you so much. Um, then the next question we have is: Are the supplement recommendations? Um, SA recommendations or US based? Uh, I can take that. Um, so the supplement recommendations at their core are effectively individual ingredients. So if you look at the probiotics recommended to people, they will be some specific strain, uh, lactobacilli or something like that. Um, prebiotics the same, it'll be a particular type of fiber. Um, now, in the app, when you get your supplement recommendations, and, and part of this, I believe, Stephen can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, because we do uh, you know, studies and research and things like that, which implement the food recommendations and the supplement interventions, um, we have done some research into specific brands uh, that contain the individual ingredients that we have uh, suggested. And so those brands are then um, just an opportunity for people to, to point them in a direction because there was a period where I think uh, yak bile was, was one of the recommendations and nobody knew where the hell to find that. So uh, we, we tried to assist them a little bit and point them in a particular direction. That's a long-winded way of saying that uh, the supplements themselves in terms of the raw ingredients um, should be able, uh, you know, available internationally you can find a brand that will have those in them um, and don't necessarily need the brand uh, that we recommended um, I, I think uh, yeah, uh, Shelly didn't as I recall didn't um, next bioscience do some work in terms of converting the supplement recommendations into brands uh, that might be available in South Africa am I remembering that yes yes thank you Stephen I was going to actually add that um, so we did some work, uh, we got the list of um, ingredients from you and we've done some work in um, identifying supplements which are available in South Africa uh, for the specific um, recommendations. So if ever you have a client that is unsure of where to get a particular supplement, you are welcome to reach out to us and we'll be able to let you know where you can purchase that in South Africa.
Okay, then we've got another question. Um, can the Vime test pick up lactose intolerances or food allergies? Uh, I can answer, and Rob, you can chime in then, of course. So the food allergy pathway is something very different. This is an immune uh, response, whether it's a type 1 or type 2, IgE or IgG, IgG4 um, response. So um, that's something very different. So we don't, we don't measure, um, in terms of the gut microbiome test, food sensitivities. Um, it's a different, a different pathway. So the reason you might um, not uh, be recommended to have broccoli is nothing to do with that you might be allergic, quote, to some of the proteins in, in broccoli. Now, uh, Rob, do as I remember, you now we ask people foods they're allergic to, and I think that somehow gets taken into account in the results, correct? Yes. Uh, so if, yeah. if you are, if, if you've obviously done a food allergy test of some kind or been confirmed to have an allergy, there is space for that in the questionnaire, and your food recommendations will reflect that. Um, uh, that said, not to overcomplicate things, but if they, if particular types of GI distress do show up in the way of um, inflammatory markers, um, that may influence whether dairy products uh, or specific grains are indicated as an avoid or a minimized food. Um, so that can also happen. But Yes. And what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Food allergies and uh, what was the other one? Uh, lactose intolerance. Uh, no, the same, different. So lactose intolerance is, is caused by uh, the lack of some particular enzymes. Um, uh, although the, the gut microbiome will have an influence um, on that. Rob, what do you know about the lactose intolerance? Yeah, you so... I know that we look at it um, in the way that we look at any microbial activity and, and, and pathway information there, because to your point, uh, the enzyme required to break down lactose is produced by um, certain microbes uh, under certain conditions. And so um, I think what gets confusing for people is they associate, because uh, a dairy allergy can be lactose intolerance, meaning the inability to break down lactose, failure, uh, you know, missing that enzyme, or it can be uh, a reaction to whey or casein, the proteins within uh, dairy, which can enter into the bloodstream and trigger, to your point, uh, an IgG or an IgE response. Um, and so uh, the lactose side of things, there is, um, we, we see that to some degree in the test and it can be reflected, but um, probably not as often as people think. So for instance, I'll give you, the, this is probably the easiest response. I personally am allergic to dairy, and despite the fact that my biome results indicate that I can break down lactose and dairy products, and in fact, they may actually be beneficial to me, I continue to avoid dairy because uh, I do know that it has a negative response on me. And that may be due to uh, my leaky gut, which biome is kind enough to point out, uh, and so some of that dairy may be entering into the bloodstream and triggering uh, my immune system via the blood as a more traditional food allergy, if that makes sense. Great, thank you so much, Rob. And we have one more question that is for Shelly. What is the process if I would like to make use of the biome test for my patients in my practice? Do I put them in contact with you or do they receive the results? Or do I receive the results? Great, thanks, Ali. Um, so, we, we've we got uh, two ways that you can uh, order the test. So you could direct your, your patients uh, to our website. Uh, they can register on the website. We will send them a collection kit. Uh, then once they've done their collection, they can let us know and we will arrange for it to be sent uh, to the Viome lab in the US. Uh, alternatively, if um, you would like to have some kits at your practice, we can also help you with that. So it would just make it a little bit easier. You can give the kits directly to your patients if you feel that you've got a patient that would benefit from the test. Um, and if that's something that you would like, you can, uh, you can get hold of us um, and we can arrange that with you. Uh, when it comes to the uh, results, there is a section in the app which allows you to email, which allows the, the clients to email the results to anyone. So if you have done the test for a patient, 
they would be able to go onto the app once the results are there and email them to you so that you have a copy of it. So um, Rob may be able to elaborate on this, but um, because it is a direct to consumer test, um, they do send the results directly to the consumer, but then um, they have got the ability to share them onto anyone. That is all correct. I have nothing to add. Thanks, Shelley. Great, great. Are there any more questions, Ali? No, that's that's it. Wonderful. Okay, so um, I would just like to thank Rob and Stephen very much for uh, dialing in and uh, for providing us with some education on Viome and how this can be implemented uh, in the practice of some of our dietitians and functional practitioners. Um, so yes, thank you for taking the time. And thank you to everyone for dialing in, and we hope that you have found the session beneficial. And if you've got any questions following this, please do reach out to us. Um, our email is biome at nextbio.co.za. Uh, you should all have the email address, and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. So thank you for your time, and I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you, and we're happy to be, to be part of what's uh, happening now in South Africa. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen.